Welcome to the website for the Treasures of the Bodleian exhibition. This exhibition has been designed to share some of the Bodleian's greatest treasures with as wide a public as possible. We'd also like you to enter into a debate with us about what characterises a treasure in the 21st century. For many hundreds of years, the Bodleian has acquired books and manuscripts that have acquired the status of treasures. We put them in exhibitions. We um, lend them to other institutions. We create facsimiles and other publications centred around them. But do they still hold the same relevance for the society of today as they have done for many years? What does it mean to designate a book or a manuscript a treasure in, in today's culture and society? We would like you to challenge us as we present this selection to you from our own curatorial experience and expertise and tell us what you think we should include in an exhibition of the Bodleian's greatest treasures. Should we include more contemporary material? Should we be more global in our out outlook? Tell us what you think the Bodleian's treasures are today. We want to hear from you. We've asked a number of experts around the university and others associated with the Bodleian to tell us what they think our treasures are and to associate themselves with particular books and manuscripts. This website introduces some of those expert opinions and we'd like you to tell us what you think about them. So this treasure here is the first collected edition of Shakespeare's works, the 1623 folio. It has Shakespeare's plays in it, not his poems. And the reason it's a fabulous Bodleian treasure is it came to the Bodleian probably in January 1624, just after it was printed, printed at the end of 1623, and it comes as part of the copyright arrangement with the Stationers Register. More extraordinarily, what happens to this book is when the later editions of the folio come out, the Bodleian decide to get rid of this one and update to the third edition, the third folio, 1663-64. So uh, they get rid of this as if it's a kind of out-of-date textbook, get the third uh, folio instead, and then the book is lost. Nobody knows where it is. And there's a fantastic story. Uh, in 1905, the sub-librarian, Falconer Madden, has a visit from a young student at Magdalen College, Gladwin Turbot. He's brought a book with him from his family estate, which is in Derbyshire. And he says, what do you think this book is? Uh, and Madden sees this, sees uh, the binding of this book, sees uh, the hole in the back, which marks where uh, the book would have been chained in the library. Uh, he calls somebody else into his office. It's a wonderful moment and they both agree this is the copy that the Bodleian had lost at some point in the mid-17th century. Uh, it's been in this uh, out-of-the-way Derbyshire uh, country house, country house estate, uh, all these years. Uh, and then uh, they start negotiations about whether they can buy it back. Uh, and what happens is that in a very hand-to-mouth, unprofessional, uh, amateurish and wonderful way, the Bodleian raises the money uh, and right at the last minute, um, £3,000 is, uh, is raised uh, and the, the volume stays uh, with the Bodleian. This is the Laxton map. It's one ninth of a massive map. This is the southwest corner, so if you can imagine the map carries on to way up here and way over there. And it's part of Nottinghamshire, and it's dated from 1635. You can see the date there. It was made by a chap by the name of Mark Pierce. Now, the key to the Laxton map is, take a look at all these strips here. It's part of feudal England, and it's a representation of how this part of the country was farmed in 1635. The beauty of it is, though, that Laxton and this part of Nottinghamshire still uses the same farming system. So if you go to Laxton today, pretty much half the area which was covered in this 1635 map looks effectively the same. You have these long strips of farming areas dotted around the countryside. The fact that this is a treasure is one, it is superbly constructed, as a, simply as a piece of cartography. It is incredibly accurate not only is it accurate, it's a gorgeous thing to look at. Look at the colours. It tells such a story. And there's a huge amount of information in here, um, both geographical, historical, social. It's all there. And the fact is that a map can bring all this together and hit you with one great visual hit. It's a, 
it's a marvellous thing and it can mean all sorts of things to different people looking at it at the same time. Um, the fact that the map itself is huge and here we only have one ninth of it, why is it a treasure though? It is the pure coincidence that here we have this map and the landscape's barely changed since and that's very rare to say for England in the 21st century. There are virtually no other parts of the country for which that can be said. So that is why this is a real treasure. We have the fortitude or the good fortune to be able to show the landscape as it was and still is. It can't be done anywhere else. The manuscript of the Watsons is a treasure because Jane Austen is one of our greatest literary figures. After Shakespeare, she is probably England's greatest writer. We have no manuscript remains for Shakespeare, but here we have Jane Austen's own hand. A manuscript is like an author's DNA or fingerprint. It gives us precious clues to how she worked, how her imagination worked, how she evolved her scenes and her characters. I'm going to talk to you today about this um, particular treasure that, um, that we have, and it's a series of uh, paintings that were put together for a large um, uh, project that um, culminated in a, in, in a volume called the Flora Greca, which was published between 1806 and 1840, um, and it's been described as the most magnificent flora ever. It's a particularly, um, it's a particularly exciting um, uh, volume to actually have this unique um, manuscript together with the actual plants that were collected on the expedition, all of the manuscript notes, all of the history of the publication of the volume, the whole collection is here and that's what really makes this, um, this material so valuable from the, um, as, as a library treasure. It's the material together, it's not necessarily one individual item but everything together. But as works of art these are magnificent. As botanical illustrations, they, are, they have very rarely been succeeded. What I'm going to be talking about is a real treasure of the Bodleian Library, but one that was very recently acquired. Uh, in fact, the, these are two maps that are from a treatise, a volume, whose very existence, much less its contents, were unknown until the manuscript came up for sale at Christie's in 2000. Now, the volume, from which these are two maps, uh, is a, essentially, it is a, an 11th century Egyptian guide to the universe. That is, it's a guide to the heavens and to the earth. It's in two books, one on the heavens, one on the earth, we don't know the author's name, uh, but the treatise he wrote is not a technical treatise. It was a treatise addressed to the general, learned, literate public, you might say. Uh, it is really what you might call a reader's digest guide to the universe, in that you have an enormous amount of information, but no technical detail. I feel that it is and was extremely important that a manuscript of this importance comes into a library so that it can be used by, a, uh, by scholars throughout the world. I uh, felt uh, very strongly about this because for it to go into a, a private collection limits the availability of that uh, manuscript for general use. Also by coming into the Bodleian, we were able to make use of the remarkable uh, conservation uh, studio here. As we plan ahead for the creation of a treasures gallery in the Western Library, we want to make sure that our selection of treasures includes the most relevant items for contemporary society and culture. Please tell us what you think should be in that exhibition room by entering into this debate with our selection today.